Anytime. All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute, and I am pleased to welcome you here and honored to be in charge this evening. For the first 35 years of my life, one of the basic facts about the world was that it was divided, half free, half slave. Behind the Iron Curtain that descended from Stettin on the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, the Communist Party ruled with an iron fist. People lived from cradle to grave without any of the freedoms that we take for granted. No freedom of speech or of religion, no freedom to start a business or choose a job, no elections, no property rights, no judges, no human dignity. And as one scholar who fled China said, no freedom of silence either. Residents of a communist state are required to make positive statements of belief and loyalty. Indeed, our speaker today made that same point in an interview with Ann Applebaum. In our camps, you were expected not only to be a slave laborer, but to sing and smile while you worked as well. They didn't just want to oppress us, they wanted us to thank them for it. And to maintain power in such a system, the communist despots used propaganda, repression, terror, an archipelago of prison camps, and in the final analysis, the murder of some 100 million people. It is wonderful that that system has largely ended. It is important that we not forget what that system was. Here at the Cato Institute, we have tried over the years not only to challenge that system intellectually, but to keep the memory of it fresh. Anne Applebaum said she did not write her book so that it would never happen again. She wrote it because it would happen again. While I'm a little more optimistic, um, I think we do talk about it so it will not happen again, but she may be right. Over the years, we have published a number of things dealing with Marxism and communism. I noticed that we were going through our warehouse, and we found this uh, old paper, Marxist Dreams and Soviet Realities. So before we clean out the warehouse, take all you want of these from the table outside, give them out to people. And while I am uh, plugging things, we also just did a conference on the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and those talks are on our website, so go check that out. And in a couple of weeks, we're... Uh, uh, showing this film, The Soviet Story. There are cards for this outside, and I urge you to pick one of these up as well. If you don't know the history of the communist world, go look it up or listen for the next hour or so. At the age of 16, Vladimir Bukovsky was expelled from school for creating and editing an unauthorized magazine. At the age of 20, he was arrested for organizing poetry meetings. Since the evidence was that he was clearly incorrigible, he was imprisoned. And over the next 14 years, he spent some 12 years in prison. Indeed, if I am reading Ann Applebaum's book, Gulag, correctly, it appears that his third arrest in 1967 actually re resulted in the creation of the Special Mental Hospitals for Incarcerating Dissidents, as the Politburo thought that would look better to Western observers than simply putting Bukowski and later other dissidents in a regular prison. Uh, this turns out not to have been a smart calculation. Uh, Westerners caught on to the idea of the Special Mental Hospitals. In his rare moments of freedom, Vladimir Bukovsky organized demonstrations in defense of dissidents and worked to expose the conditions of political prisoners. In 1971, he managed to smuggle to the West over 150 pages documenting abuse of psychiatric institutions for political reasons in the USSR. The information galvanized human, active, uh, human rights activists worldwide, including inside Russia, and, of course, resulted in his arrest yet again. He remained in prison after that until he was deported in 1976. It is hard for an American even to imagine the courage that Vladimir Bukovsky demonstrated for two decades to go into the Soviet prisons, 
and come out and go right back to exposing the truth and agitating for change is simply an unbelievable story. And he never stopped trying to expose the truth about communism. In 1983, he helped to create Resistance International, a coordinating center for opponents of communism. And in 1991, he returned to Russia for the first time. He was granted exclusive access to a large number of documents from Soviet archives in preparation for a trial. He wasn't allowed to copy them, only to see them. But he brought a laptop and a hand scanner, accurately guessing that the Russian guards wouldn't recognize those devices. He managed to smuggle out of the archives a series of documents, scanned documents, including KGB reports to the Central Committee, which were later published electronically under the name Soviet Archives. The collection of documents was later massively quoted in his book, Judgment in Moscow, based on his experience in 1992 with what he had hoped would be a Nuremberg-style trial for the Communist Party of the Soviet Union before the Constitutional Court of Russia. And he has continued speaking out for freedom and justice around the world against Vladimir Putin's quest for total power in Russia, against the use of torture by the United States, against the drive for centralized power in the European Union. He honors us by serving as a senior fellow of the Cato Institute. We have had plenty of elected officials on this podium. We've had business leaders. We've had lots of scholars, including Nobel laureates. But rarely do we have the opportunity to hear from a hero. We do tonight. Please welcome Vladimir Bukovsky. Thank you. Um, I have a strange feeling that I should start speaking Russian. How many people understand Russian in this audience? Tell me. Well, clearly more than 50 percent. So. <laughs> Well, my friends, I'm afraid for those of you who speak Russian, obviously you know the situation in that country more or less in the same way as I do. So what I'm about to say would not be useful. Uh, but uh, it so happened that this, this year we celebrate the 20th anniversary of spectacular events uh, which swept across Central and Eastern Europe and brought down all the regimes there. At that time, this spectacular development was welcomed with great enthusiasm as the end of Cold War, end of communism, and even as end of history. Now, 20 years down the, down the road, we, were, we have to sober up and to say that we were a bit too enthusiastic. Not only uh, quite a number of communist regimes still living in like in China or Cuba or North Vietnam, uh, Vietnam and North Korea, but even new countries are joining that uh, would be extinct camp, like uh, Venezuela, and that is particularly strange. Uh, the countries of East, Central of East European uh, uh, and East, uh, Central and Eastern Europe also did not transcend their past. When I visit there, and I do it quite often, I'm always reminded that they're still uh, trying to somehow cut themselves off their past and still cannot do it completely. You can feel the influence, the drag on their current developments uh, in, in all the problems they have, both economic and political. It's always uh, someone surfaces in their political life who is ultimately recognized as former KGB informer or something like that, which doesn't really improve their public life. Uh, and of course, the existence of such a big number of nomenclature in their governing apparatus does not help them at all. It usually uh, drags them back, slows down the pace of reforms makes things more and more difficult. But the worst scenario, which one could have imagined 20 years ago, could be observed in Russia today. 
what we see there is a, a march a march backwards i would say some kind some kind of uh, revisionism some kind of uh, restoration process going on there as we all remember uh, then at that time president putin defined the end of soviet union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of 20th century uh, which was really a strange thing to hear. I always believed that the emergence of Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of all times, but he, he thinks the opposite. And of course he acts accordingly. For them, for the people who came to power with him, and they're predominantly KGB people, the most important thing is to restore as much as possible of the Soviet system. Of course they understand that it's not possible to do completely. The time has changed. There are so many things which could not be returned and they don't try to do that. The country cannot be closed down with modern technology, with internet, with mobile phones and satellite television. You can't close down the country. And if you don't close it down, you can't restore the Soviet system. Also, I doubt they can introduce many restrictions on movement anymore. For example, the right to travel abroad uh, although may be irritating for them, nevertheless it's impossible to cut down. In the country which is so much corrupt as Russia today, any restrictions actually translate into a price of bribery. Uh, it's kind of a quasi-market mechanism. So if, they, so if they try to reduce certain degrees of freedom for people, people would just pay bribes bigger than they would have done otherwise. So it is an attempt, a not very convincing attempt at restoring the Soviet system, but sometimes pretty painful. I mean, elections today are not elections. We all know that. I participated two years ago just for fun in what they call presidential elections. It was not presidential elections. It was not elections at all. It was, it was kind of a, a game. Uh, what would they invent to disqualify you? We did it, several of us, including Gary Kasparov, myself, Nemtsov, uh, and Kasyanov. And we thought who of us would be disqualified on, each sta on, on which stage. That was kind of a game. And Gary was the one to drop, the, the first to drop down. I have managed to hold on for longer than others, but the longest was Kasyanov. He even managed to get two million signatures. But then he was told that all of the signatures are forgery, including his own. So that's, so he was disqualified as well. Uh, no, it's not an election anymore, and we've lost this institution. Other institutions of democracy very quickly dismantled. Uh, the freedom of press is now is, uh, symbolic. What remains of uh, that freedom of press are probably one radio station and one newspaper, and their fate is not clear uh, even as we speak. Uh, what, what is more uh, depressing is that the country returned to political repressions. We have today a couple of dozens of political prisoners again, which I thought would never happen in my lifetime. Even more than that, at certain point, the psychiatric use for repressions was returned again. And that was by far the most depressing news for me. I thought we buried that method of repressing forever. And yet it did happen again, several cases. Luckily, we managed to stop it in time, but we cannot guarantee it would not be renewed tomorrow. Also, the new feature, which we didn't see much, but our parents saw a lot political murders. That became kind of normal way of life in, in Russia today. Uh, someone calculated that in the last eight years, uh, 62 journalists were murdered. I would imagine not all of them were murdered by the orders of Kremlin. Some of them were ordered by local authorities because they were investigating local corruption. But nevertheless, this kind of practice is condoned from the center because none of these crimes was ever successfully investigated and prosecuted. 
So it is for this very day, not a single of these assassins was brought to justice. In the foreign relations, the, the current leadership also is trying to restore what they used to call the Soviet sphere of influence, which makes them aggressive and what somewhat dangerous for the neighbors. We've seen a year ago what happened with Georgia, but uh, it's only one episode of many. Previously, before that, we had a rather sad story of uh, political pressure on Estonia. Uh, right now, we can observe a mounting pressure on Ukraine in, because of the coming Ukrainian presidential elections, with all sorts of threats and rumors being circulated, uh, and uh, the, the, the idea of, of Kremlin, of course, is to, to scare the population by the prospect of possible military conflict uh, uh, so much that they would vote for pro-Moscow candidate. I think that's their calculation, but I'm afraid uh, they are not very good at this kind of analysis, and they are bound to miscalculate greatly. Uh, I would expect the Ukrainians would actually uh, become very angry at these attempts at meddling into their elections, and they would probably elect the most anti-Russian candidate, just as their way of reacting to it all. But if you look at the West, 20 years after this spectacular event of collapsing communism and the hopes we all ha had for the uh, emergence of democracy, of victory for democracy in all the world, when so many formerly dictatorial regimes in the third world suddenly became democracies, we hoped forever. Even in the West today we observe a retreat. Once again, the, uh, the pattern of dictatorship, of oppression, of uh, lack of freedom of speech. We all observe that, not only in the third world countries, but un unfortunately in Europe as well as in the United States. In Europe we have emerging a new monster of European Union which looks uh, suspiciously very much like a Soviet Union in many respects. Admittedly, it's a pale copy of the Soviet Union. They still did not develop gulag in Europe. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do. If you look at what they're doing and how they're formulating their future structures, uh, you can, and at least I can, with my experience, see how it may go very badly. For example, uh, just now they've managed to force Ireland to vote for Lisbon Treaty, which is a substitute for the European Constitution previously rejected by France and Holland, now brought back through the back door. Uh, what does it include among all the symbols of the unitary state, the presidency, the emblem, the hymn, the, the anthem? Uh, it also brings what they call Europol, European Police Force. And uh, naturally, being an old convict, my first interest was what this police would be doing and what power is going to have. And apparently it's going to have sweeping powers, according to this agreement. To begin with, they are going to have diplomatic immunity. How do you like it? A policeman with diplomatic immunity. He comes, he takes whatever he likes, he beats me up, and I can't even sue him. Very nice. But then you read further and you become more and more apprehensive. This police force would have a right to, uh, to uh, conduct extradition from one country to another without any appearance at court. So you don't need to go through a court procedure in order to be extradited from Britain to Greece or Italy or wherever. Further on, we are told that uh, Europol is going to police us on 32 counts of crimes. 32 counts of crimes. Two of which are particularly interesting because they don't exist in the penal code of any civilized country. One is called racism, and another is called xenophobia. And of course, our authorities have already explained to us in a very quiet manner that those of us who would be objecting to the uh, immigration policy of the European Union would be uh, blamed for racism. And those of us who oppose the further integration of Europe would be charged with a crime of xenophobia. So we already know 
where the European Gulag is going to appear. I doubt they would ever have camps like we used to have in Siberia. They don't have Siberia. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we, uh, if we, people like myself, don't like freedoms to be abridged, were ultimately sent to psychiatric observation. That is, wouldn't be surprise me at all. And actually in Britain, they've already created an organ, a, a bureaucracy, which will be doing exactly that. It's called FTAC. It's a joint operation of uh, 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 Home Ministry, Home Office, and of the uh, Ministry of uh, Public Health. And they will be recommended people for observation in psychiatric ward if they show any manifestation of their extremism. Now, as you can imagine, definitions like extremism are so subjective that uh, any one of us will be turned that way any moment. Apart from that, and on the top of it all, we have the ideology of political correctness sweeping the land. And that becomes very abusive and very difficult in, in the conditions of Europe. I don't know about Americans. It looks like Americans like political correctness, but in Europe we don't. They introduced something they call the hate speech, again, through European systems, the system of the European Union. Uh, and that really reminds me of my young my, my use when people who could be uh, imprisoned for making jokes. And indeed that's what might happen, and already there are some indications it will happen. If you make any jokes about homosexuals or people of different race, uh, you are very likely to be arrested in Britain today. At least the legal uh, 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 ground for that is created. There is already past law on that subject. The European Union itself becomes more and more bizarre. Each country which joins this is supposed to introduce something like 80,000 pages of regulations and rules, which in itself is crazy. Uh, also because uh, the, uh, the national parliaments are not given time to consider what, what this is about, they are just required to rubber stamp it. No questions, they have no right to correct it. Some of them are incredibly strange. It's a case of bureaucracy which went mad. At one point, a couple of years ago, I was reading a new directive of the European Union, according to which all the owners of, uh, of uh, pig uh, farms were uh, obliged to supply their pigs with colored bowls because pigs become bored. So that's that is nothing. I mean, this year I found another, another new uh, piece of legislation from the European Union, which prohibits us Europeans to kill horses and zebras. My immediate thought was, how about giraffes? Can we at least kill giraffes? I mean, <laughs> we are living in a madhouse in Europe right now. They decided that we produce too much of garbage. They modeled every European country on Denmark. Mind you, Denmark is a very small country. So as a result of it, they collect our garbage only once in two weeks, and they refuse to do it once a week. In the summer, as a result of it, the bags are piling up, the rats multiplying, the, the, the stench in, in cities is incredible. And they are trying to protest, but what can we do? There is no mechanism in the European Union by which you can change their mind. We're not electing them. We cannot sack them. They point each other like Politburo. The only elected part of the European Union is the European Parliament. Now, since I'm a patron of uh, a British anti-European uh, Union uh, party called UKIP, United Kingdom Independence Party, I quite often go to European Parliament to cheer our boys behind enemy lines, so to speak. And uh, I know what it is. It's, it's an incredible thing. I mean, Supreme Soviet of old Soviet Union looks like a model legislature as compared with the European Parliament. To begin with, it's huge. It's something like 12, 12 or 1,400 people. And they don't sit throughout the, the year. They only have a couple of weeks a month in session. As a result of that, every member of European Parliament 
has only six minutes a year to speak in chamber. Six minutes a year. But they're paid incredibly fat salaries, which are not taxed. It's an international organization. Uh, and above all, uh, above that, they have their personal chauffeur, secretaries, uh, I don't know, manicure, I wouldn't imagine what else. Uh, and, uh, uh, and on the top of it all, they have 100,000 euros a year for their extra parliamentary activity. And all of that moves. At least the Supreme Soviet was staying in Moscow. But this strange arrangement moves. One month it is in, in Strasbourg. Next month it packs up with all their secretaries and chauffeurs and translators. I forgot to say, they have about 25,000 translators. Because every language should be translated to every language, you see. Uh, and they all move to Brussels. After one month in Brussels, they pack up and they go to Luxembourg. After one month in Luxembourg, they pack up and they, the whole gypsy camp moves back to Strasbourg. Can you imagine how much it costs? I mean, just moving the whole bloody thing. You know, it's just astronomical. The European Commission itself uh, has uh, a life which any one of us would enjoy. Apart from, uh, like I mentioned already, not paying any taxes, they actually have a lifelong immunity from prosecution. So they can steal whatever they like. They cannot be prosecuted. And they do. They do avail themselves, believe me. It's incredible. Their own auditors refuse to sign European budget for 10 years on end because it's impossible to sign. So it's open budget. They take as much as they wish. There was once a big scandal, so big that they had to resign. The whole commission resigned. There was a very theatrical gesture because in two months the very same people came on slightly different positions. It was like an old deck of cards. They were just shuffled and placed again. Nothing changes. We cannot change anything with them. And that's only the beginning. Because if we read carefully what they say, like people like Romano Prodi says what is going to be in store for us in, in Europe, you suddenly discover that the next move of the European Union, expansion of it, is going to be Middle East, and then countries of North Africa, and then on and on, till the whole planet of Earth is united in the European Union. It all reminds me of Soviet Union. They had exactly the same thing, which was killing them. Uh, they couldn't stop expanding. The moment they stop, they start falling apart. The same seems to be true with the European Union. They would pursue a smallest country like Malta. I mean, who cares about Malta? No, the European Union will spend a lot of resources, money and energy to persuade Malta to join the European Union. They did succeed. And so it goes. It's all so much similar to Soviet Union that I really wake up every morning with a feeling of deja vu. What can we do with it? That's a big problem. We don't have any instruments to influence them. What, what, what can we say? If that is a result 20 years after the spectacular events in Europe which seem to finish with the communist utopia, what is our conclusion then? My conclusion is that we didn't win the Cold War. Of course, if we understand Cold War in a very narrow sense, like a confrontation between the Soviet bloc countries and the NATO countries, then we won simply because one bloc disappeared and another remained. But it was never understood that narrowly. The Cold War was always a confrontation between the liberal democracy and the totalitarian socialism. It was always ideological confrontation, the war of ideas. And that war, apparently, we never won. Moreover, I don't think we ever fought this war, with the exception of few years after World War II under Harry Truman and few years under Ronald Reagan, we didn't have any war. It was called, uh, it, was, it was named Cold War, but there was no war whatsoever. There was detente, there was improved relations, uh, relaxation of international tension, peaceful coexistence, I forgot all the expressions they used. But there was no Cold War, only two small periods. 
which actually proved to be sufficient to, to finish them off. But in reality, the most of the time, the West was engaging in the typical policy of appeasement about the Soviet bloc. And appeasers don't win wars. So speaking about winning Cold War is one of the biggest lies of our time. We didn't win, and it, it is not over. And the fact that it suddenly resurfaces, then suddenly we have uh, uh, revanchist tendencies in Russia and uh, uh, emergence of communism in Venezuela and things like that are just confirming it. We did not win, the, win this uh, war. We didn't finish this idea. Unfortunately, we were not given a chance of doing that. There was a chance in 1991, 92, and we tried to achieve it. Because in order to uh, finish this off, we needed a trial. We needed a trial of Nuremberg style. Not necessarily putting on trial any, any real people or culprits or whatever. In a country like Soviet Union, if you try to find the guilty people, you will end up with 19 million people or something. And who needs another gulag? I mean, it wasn't a question of punishing individuals. It was a question of judging system as a criminal system. We tried to do that, and I've spent a lot of time trying to persuade Yeltsin government. Yeltsin finally said no. Most of his entourage were in favor of it. Yeltsin said no. First thing, and I would suspect that was one of his motives, he probably understood that if he goes along with this idea, although he personally did not commit any crimes, the situation in the country will change so much that people like him would have no place in politics and public life anymore. He was too high up in the communist hierarchy. He was a member of Politburo. But more than that, the reason he had to say no was enormous pressure he, he felt from the West not to have such a trial. And I'm saying that knowledgeably. I've seen the cables he received from all over the world, mostly from Russian embassies, explaining that local politicians and local governments and uh, whatever authorities of their place may be are vehemently against any trials, any disclosure of uh, crimes of communism, any opening of archives. And finally, Yeltsin, who wasn't very sure of himself, who believed in the West like he previously believed in Marx, he just gave in, he accepted this pressure, and he would not allow us to trial. A year later, in 1992, when, as it was mentioned already, there was a constitutional court trial in Moscow between President Yeltsin and the Communist Party, I was invited to be an expert at the Constitutional Court of Russia, which I was, and in that capacity I had the right to subpoena documents, which I used very widely. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, uh, I was not supposed to copy it, but the, uh, the rules how you deal with secret documents were very old. They were written under the Soviet regime, and they didn't know what scanning is about. So they would go through all the ways of copying and saying, well, it's not permitted. The xerxing is not permitted. The copying by hand is not permitted. They were very kind of descriptive in it. One thing was, which was missing was scanning, because at that time they didn't know about scanning. And mind you, even in the West it was a novelty. In 1992, uh, hand scanners uh, were not on sale any, uh, 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 yet. I've uh, found an experimental model from a friend of mine who's a businessman in computer business, so I got it. So I came with this uh, uh, notebook, computer, and hand scanner. Uh, mind you, computer at that time was also ridiculously small. It was 40 megabyte hard disk, nothing. Uh, and I was sitting in the middle of this court with the former members of Politburo sitting in one part of the hall, with new ministers of Yeltsin government sitting in another part, and me in the middle with a small table, scanning quietly 48 volumes of secret documents. And, uh, the only thing which puzzled or interested this uh, distinguished uh, audience 
uh, as they would say in the breaks when they would congregate behind my back and look at me. The only thing they were asking was, well, that must be a very expensive machine. And I would confirm, indeed, it is expensive by the standards of the time. But I didn't understand what I was doing. In this manner, I've uh, managed to copy 7,000 documents. But that was not enough. Of course, authorities became mad at me for doing that. I've published a book. And for about 15 years, they wouldn't give me a visa to visit Russia. Uh, but I'd never take no for answer. So a, friend, a son of my friends was growing up in Moscow. So I was in correspondence with him, and he was a young fellow, 18-year-old. So I've told him where to go and what to do. He turned out to be more successful than I am. He went to Gorbachev Foundation, discovered that in that foundation the copies of secret documents are retained by Gorbachev, quite illegally, mind you. Uh, he asked permission to work with some archives, but then broke the passwords and copied the whole computer. He brought me two gigabytes of documents, about 100,000 pages. So at the moment we have practically the full picture of what happened. And we now understand why the West was so much against putting the communist system on trial. And it's very simple. It's not only that the West was uh, infiltrated by the Soviets much deeper than we ever thought. Not only that, but also there was ideological collaboration between the left-wing parties in the West and the Soviet Union. And this ideological collaboration was very deep. For example, and that brings us back to European Union, for example, in the middle of 80s, the European left parties talked to Gorbachev and explained to him that uh, it's difficult to organize socialism in one country. We should do it in all Europe at once. And for that, we should take over European project. So, and Gorbachev confirmed it. He said, yes, it would be very good, marvelous. So they decided to uh, uh, launch the project called Common European Home which in essence is the precursor of what we have now as the European Union. Prior to 1985, both Soviets and the European left were very much against uh, European integration. They perceived it as a uh, development against them. But after 85, when they understood both sides that the socialism is in deep crisis, they understood that it's a good device for them to salvage socialism, as they call it. In the remaining years of the Soviet Union, the West was helping with all its power uh, to retain, to salvage, to support the Soviet Union. Not only they gave Gorbachev something like $45 billion, which is, uh, at that time was quite a considerable amount of money, but they did help him in diplomatic way, in any other way possible, even to the point that uh, President Bush would go to Ukraine in 1991 and try to persuade Ukrainians not to leave Soviet Union. Something incredibly stupid if, if you think about it. Uh, their argument with Gorbachev was very simple. We need Soviet Union. And I quote you, such diverse politicians of the left in Europe like President of France Mitterrand, Prime Minister of uh, Spain Gonzalez, uh, like um, uh, uh, former Chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt, uh, and so on and so forth. They all were telling Gorbachev, we need strong Soviet Union because a collapse of socialism in the East would bring a crisis of this idea in the West. So in order to save their own uh, political privilege and position, they were sacrificing all of us, our future, our possibility of developing ever democratic countries. And they were supporting this agonizing regime, which was doomed anyway. And when it finally died, none of them ever expressed any jubilation. I don't know how much you remember yourself, but I do remember. I was so puzzled that there is no jubilation. The biggest monster on earth just died in front of us. 
a monster which could have killed us many times in the post-war period. And there was no jubilation. It was quiet. I forgot someone of European politicians said, well, let's say no one, no one is a, a winner. Let's call it a draw. I was so much angry with that that I planted a tree in my garden in memory of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's still growing up in very beautiful cherry tree. Shall we go to the questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's uh, open the floor. Let's open the floor for questions. Uh, you can call on people and we'll bring a microphone so they can be heard and, and captured on the tape. <coughs> well, I have a question. Um, you have, I think, in the past compared the, the way Nazism ended and the way communism ended. Since you weren't able to have the trial in Moscow that you wanted, is there something else that should be done to create the record to finalize the collapse of communism? Yes, I always, uh, in explaining what actually happened, I always uh, uh, suggest such a pattern, such a putative picture that uh, 1945, for example, the victorious allies would uh, uh, not demand unconditional surrender, but would accept some kind of perestroika of Nazi Germany which would uh, allow one of the uh, deputies of Goebbels to become new chancellor of Germany, something like that. You know. And obviously, if that, is to, if that was to happen, uh, the Nazi party, under somewhat different name, would have come back to power and continued to rule the countries of Europe uh, with somewhat more mild regimes than the Nazi regime was, but they would stay in power one way or another. And of course the SS would very quickly take into their hands all businesses and uh, organize them in a way of a mafia and would be controlling it all. So that's exactly, I'm afraid, what happened in our part of land. Exactly for the same reason. What can we do today about it? Well, I personally believe that we can have our public Nuremberg. Of course, we cannot force the governments to do that, but the amount of documents we have already accumulated, the collective memory of people who went through this experience in different countries of communism in the world, and in Eastern Europe and Central Europe in particular, is quite big. The number of people who are still alive, who witnessed that, is enormous. We cannot have our public trial of the communist system and condemn it. The governments would never agree to that. I know that. But we, we the people, can do that. And I think ultimately we should do that. The sooner, the better. Who is deciding? Right here. <laughs> you should decide. Who okay. Is. Ken Dillon, Ciencia Press. In many countries and in Russia's history, uh, students have played an important role as the conscience of the country and as those who are among the greatest proponents of, of freedom. Could you discuss that in regard to Russia today? The students, where are they? What are they doing? What are they thinking about this? How are they uh, influenced by the government? And so on. Well, it's a very simple question. I mean, as soon as we have the military reform and the army would cease to be uh, the army of recruits, then you would suddenly have very active political students. But as long as, the, uh, as they live under the threat of being drafted into the army and in particular sent into North Caucasus to kill Chechens and be killed, most of them prefer not to show their political uh, interests. It's still very much in the hands of the government, the whole thing. And the students still have uh, uh, some provision in law which allows them not to serve in the army, uh, at least delayed for some, some time their service in the army. So that is the biggest, uh, uh, let's say, club by which the government is beating down 
the impulses of young people in Russia. That's one thing. Another thing, in the last few years, people became so apathetic in the country and so hopeless that uh, the younger and brighter people prefer to immigrate, and they do in droves. And I'm sure you know it because quite a few of them come to the United States. I don't blame them for that. I mean, you cannot say to an 18-year-old, well, wait for 30 years, it's going to be better. 30 years is all he has to develop his talents and his abilities, and you can't deprive him of that. So I understand them, but uh, speaking of the consequences of it, uh, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to say that it uh, uh, makes uh, any positive development even less likely. So that, that's, that's the reason why we don't have that many young people active politically in Russia. Yes, in the back and then right here. Okay. Amy, go ahead and bring a mic here for the next question. Uh, I'm Alex Piminov from the Russian service of the Voice of America. Uh, Vladimir Konstantinovich, I have two questions for you. First, uh, when you started uh, your activity as a human rights fighter and dissident, did you expect uh, the Soviet Union to fall uh, so comparatively soon, uh, historically speaking? That's my first question. And the second one is, uh, how would you characterize the current society uh, in Russia? What kind of political and economic system uh, is it? Um, because you mentioned a couple of times that it's certainly neither a democracy nor uh, the former Soviet Union. What kind of society is that then? Does it have any historical or contemporary parallels in the world except the EU, of course? Thank you. Well, the EU is more closely resembling Soviet Union, not the today's Russia. Well, as, as far as uh, uh, our use is concerned, uh, well, at the beginning, when we just started the human rights movement, uh, we didn't expect anything to happen. And mostly uh, our movement was rather, rather ethical than political. So we didn't have any particular political goals to achieve. Uh, for us, the kind of moral imperative was more important. You couldn't be silent. You couldn't accept. Uh, you couldn't be a part of that system, uh, and that's it no matter what will happen. Would you achieve any results or not, was irrelevant. Actually, lots of us, I remember, uh, 40 years ago, uh, would not expect to live uh, more than for 30 years or something. It, it was uh, illogical to believe that you would survive longer uh, in view of things which they would be throwing at you. Uh, and it might have happened, and quite a few of my friends didn't live long. So, uh, but the understanding of a fact that the Soviet Union is going to collapse was there. We all knew that. And uh, my friend Andrei Amalrikov published a book in 1969, 1969, which was called Will the Soviet Union uh, Survive Till 1984? And of course he didn't mean 84 in terms of calendar. He, he meant it in a very sense. And I talked with him at that time. Uh, we all believe that it's going to collapse, and more or less on the same lines as Amalek described it. Uh, we simply didn't know when and how. And uh, uh, I personally miscalculated by about 10 years. I always thought that it will collapse by the turn of a century, and it happened to be 10 years earlier. But some things are impossible to calculate, particularly dates. No one can calculate dates because of so many factors. Uh, which you can't analyze to the end. So you, you can generally predict the tendency, but saying what, which year, how it will happen is impossible. No one of us expected the emergence of Gorbachev with his Hitrastroika. We, we didn't expect that to happen. Uh, uh, no one expected the emergence of Ronald Reagan, who speeded up the whole process of collapse of the Soviet Union by increasing arms race and raising the cost of empire for the Soviets. So all these things... Uh, were impossible to predict. They, they, many of them depended on human factor, on factor of one or another individual. Uh, but in reality, yes, we, we all believe that it will be collapsing one day. We might not survive till then, that's another story. But it will collapse because the whole system was so absurd, so ridiculous, so impossible to exist, uh, that it couldn't do anything else but collapse. 
right here, and then we'll take one here in the front row. My name is Stephen Shore. Two brief questions. I don't know if you're familiar with Vlad Tishmeyanu, who is now at the University of Maryland, who did a report documenting all the evils and abuses of communism in Romania and presented it to the the president of Romania. I'm wondering if this, my, my first question is, would this be a wholesome example for other nations that were once in the Soviet bloc? And my second question is, looking back on Gorbachev now, would it be fair to describe him, I don't remember, the, I don't remember the word in Russian, but Dostoevsky used what is known as a holy fool. Mm. Well, as far as Tishmian is concerned, uh, yes, that's a valuable contribution he's doing, and he's not uh, the only one. I'm quite often in Romania, and I know that number of people working in this field. For example, a good friend of mine, Maria, Ma, uh, Mar Marius uh, Aprea, for example, he was appointed by uh, today's president, Basescu, to uh, chair a special uh, structure institution for investigating the abuses of securitate in the Soviet time, in, in the communist time. So, uh, and many others. In Romania, uh, Basescu made a very strong statement saying that we should investigate the past and condemn it. He made a statement to his parliament, and that's kind of promise on his part. And I wish other countries would do the same. But the attempts of doing similar things in different countries are not necessarily the same and not necessarily successful. Poles, for example, tried several times to introduce illustration, and each time they would kind of bog down. They wouldn't go further. Czechs did the same. Even, even Cambodians put the Khmer Rouge on trial last year, although most of them died by now. Uh, so the, the desire, the necessity to do that is understood by a lot of people. It's not only our desire to restore the, the truth, historic truth, or justice. It's more than that. We all want our nations to, well, to look into their soul and to understand how much they themselves contributed to this evil. And unless and until they do that, they would not start building new life. That's for sure. Germans were lucky. They were occupied. And the Nuremberg tri trial was forced on them. And as a result of it, they understood, indeed accepted the, their, their national guilt. And once they accepted that, they started building Germany. And in 10 years, they had economic miracle in Germany. In 10 years in Russia, we had anything but a miracle. And it all go down and down. People are still sitting and, and complaining and blaming anyone for the collapse of the former Soviet Union. CIA, the Jews, the Masons, I don't know. I mean, there's so many theories on the Internet, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, anyone but themselves. And unfortunately, until they understand and admit to themselves what it was, we wouldn't be cured of it. Oh, the Gorbachev. Well, Gorbachev, I've seen thousands of pages of transcripts of his negotiations with different leaders and, uh, uh, and uh, his, uh, his talks on Politburo, you know, it's, uh, I, I've got it all. He was a smart operator, but he was a crook. I mean, he knew perfectly well that what is he doing is not what he's saying. And nevertheless, he continued trying to deceive everyone. He was, in a sense, a typical communist. Uh, he believed that you can deceive economy, you can cheat history, you can, you know, uh, deceive people, and somehow manage to get into paradise before anyone notices. You know, that, uh, that, it's a typical communist, you know. It's, I remember arguing with Margaret Thatcher about it. She didn't understand him at all. She became an amour. He's great, he's, uh, I can do business with him, things like that. And I was very angry. I came and said, why do you say that? Oh, he's pragmatic. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you give me a definition of pragmatic communist? Because it seemed to be oxymoron. I mean, it couldn't be. She couldn't. I said, then I can. A pragmatic communist is a communist who run out of money. It's very simple. <laughs> She didn't like it. She didn't agree with me. And I finally, we, we argued with her for seven years, but she's a very stubborn lady. But she's, 
which is good when she got it right. But it's a disaster when she got it wrong, you know. So finally, ultimately, I got her. Because I found in archive a document proving how the Soviets gave secretly one million dollars to the coal miners who were on strike in 1984 in Britain. The, that was rumored at the time that Soviets gave money, but what I discovered in the Central Committee document was more than that. It was authorized by Gorbachev, because he was second secretary at that time, in charge of these kind of things. So I rushed and brought it to Margaret Thatcher, here is your friend. She turned pale. She said, when did he sign it? We found the date. She said, it's even worse. I asked him, asked him about that exactly at that time, and he said he knows nothing. And that was my moment of glory, and I said, well, you see how it is to do business with companies, they have a very nasty habit of looking straight into your eyes and lie. So that was, but the majority of people in the West still believe him a great figure, a great uh, liberator or whatever. He's, he's a very strange fellow in a sense. I mean, he probably mean, meant uh, good, but he didn't understand his own country. He didn't understand what he's doing. I mean, a lot of things he started, he lost control over, over them, and they developed further and much further than he wanted. He actually finally lost uh, the whole country because he didn't understand his own nation. He still believed that some form of socialism would be acceptable. He would never, ever say, let's return to capitalism. No. I've seen hundreds of his uh, minutes of Politburo or whatever. No. He always speaks about socialist market uh, market socialism, God knows what, very strange kind of uh, crossbreeds between impossible things. But he, let's give socialism second breath, he says, as if it ever had one, a first. He, he never understood anything. He was a very strange fellow, but profoundly dishonest. I remember, apart from these uh, transcripts of conversations and, uh, uh, and the Politburo meetings, uh, uh, my my uh, assistant also copied uh, a diary which Gorbachev's assistant, Chernyaev, was conducting all his life. And uh, the part he got was from 71 to 91. A very interesting uh, document. And in that uh, lengthy document, it's about 2,000 pages long, he describes one episode, how he in 1988, I think, gave Gorbachev to read Solzhenitsyn's Lenin in Zurich. It's very interesting what he, uh, he says about it. Gorbachev read it, came next day, brought it, and he said, Damn, the book is anti-Soviet. It's anti-Soviet. But is, Lenin is recognizable. Lenin uznavayim. Recognizable. And then he says he was mostly shocked by the fact that Lenin was only one quarter Russian, and he couldn't stomach that. He said, no, this book we shouldn't ever publish in Russia. Our people wouldn't understand it, no. So that's Gorbachev for you. I remember once asking Yakovlev about his friend Gorbachev and saying, uh, how do you find him? I, I personally think he's a liar. He lies any time he opens his mouth. And uh, Yakovlev said, yes, you are right. We used to say Gorbachev lies even when he says the truth. <laughs> so that's characteristic of his number two. All right, right here. What kind of advice would you have to the current administration in dealing with Russia? You mean American administration? Yes, American. To change administration quickly. <laughs> quickly. No. But. Uh, we seem to we well okay what and by Russia I mean both with the government and with an with the civil society. In de, yeah, that is to say, for example, uh, the policies that we seem to be uh, faced with right now of putting human rights on on a second tier, not meeting with Dalai Lama and so forth, to what extent, so, so yeah, that's the question. Well, I mean, so far they made 
very little in foreign policy, and whatever they did was wrong. I mean, I remember that so-called reset of relations. Probably many of you noticed that they couldn't even translate the word into Russian properly. The whole State Department, working full-time, couldn't translate one word into Russian. That shows you the level of the expertise. I mean, they can't understand. What does it mean, reset relations with Russia? Russians are not going to reset their relations. Did they give back the pieces of Georgia? No. Did they agree on anything they didn't like before reset? No. Americans had to retreat. That was a reset. Americans had to give up the idea of placing anti-ballistic missile system in Poland and Czech Republic. Russians didn't need to do anything. Reset for them was just to accept whatever Americans give them. So that just shows you how little these people understand. I'm afraid they are not the only ones. I don't want to talk about this administration because it's not an administration. I, uh, uh, it's just an abomination. But, uh, uh, but the previous administration wasn't bad. I mean, look at uh, our friend Condi Rice, whom we all knew. I knew she from Stanford very well. And she used to be very good in Soviet, on Soviet Union. She did understand things. And yet she became vehemently pro-Putin. I mean, they didn't understand what they're dealing with, unfortunately, and they still don't. They don't understand that they're dealing with a KGB power. It's not Russian power. They all believe it's a national Russian. No, it's not. It's a KGB power. And a KGB is a very strange type of people. They don't have normal partnership relations. They don't understand it. There are only two types of relations they have with you. You're either the enemy or you're the agent. Nothing in between. In between is they're still working to recruit you. That's it. Uh, and that's exactly Putin's position. I mean, he doesn't understand normal relations. So Kondi Rice would come and try to persuade Russians, Putin, that this anti-ballistic missile would not threaten your military interests. Don't worry. And the more she tries to find the compromise, the bigger the pressure she will get in response. Because for the KGB, the, uh, your attempt to find a compromise means weakness. So you can demand more and more. Now Obama, with, with that lady, decided to abandon uh, uh, the, the anti-ballistic missile project, believing that they are buying some benevolence from Kremlin in the case of Iran and things like that. It's total rubbish. They just increase their demands more and more. Then they would demand that they will build anti-ballistic missiles for the whole Europe or something like that. And of course, they are not going to help Americans with Iran. I don't see why should they. It's only for their benefit if Iranians have a quarrel with Americans. So, and so on and so forth. So we are talking about universal phenomena of not understanding this type of people. All right, right there in the front, and then over here on the wall. Thank you. I'm John Huntley with the uh, American Conservative magazine. Uh, my first question was very similar. If you could, if you could manage American foreign policy, what what should American foreign policy be, uh, dealing with uh, the KGB or whatever? And secondly, can you speak about Memorial? Uh, how are they doing? Are they still strong? Are they, are they everywhere like they once were? How are they surviving? Well, let me start from the end. I mean, the memo memorial people, of course, are in a very difficult position. As you know, uh, the Putin regime changed the law on uh, non-governmental organizations. First, non-governmental organizations are not allowed to receive any uh, financial help from abroad anymore. That's cut down. Uh, within the country, the local, the national businesses are not likely to give any money to uh, oppositional type organization after Khodorkovsky. They are a very bright example in front of them, what happens to a businessman who helps oppositional structures. So none of them would ever dare to do that. So most of the NGOs in Russia right now are experiencing enormous uh, problem. They don't have money. They're squeezed out. They, they offered the help from Kremlin, of course, if they become pro-Kremlin. That's what's happening with uh, these organizations. Memorial is one of the most known in the West uh, NGOs. And, uh, people are still trying to help them by all means, and the government is not as decisive with them as it is with many others. But if they're going to respect their own law, and they would, 
in due time memorial would be left without money. And the first question was, I forgot. What do you recommend for U.S. foreign policy? Um, well, there is a successful example of foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Union. That's Reagan's policy of the first four years, and that was very successful. Uh, Reagan understood perfectly well that uh, this regime is not going to be friendly to him ever. And the only thing they can do is to bankrupt it. So that's what he was doing. He increased arms race, he increased what we used to call cost of the empire, making it costly, more costly with, with uh, uh, attempts at, at holding it uh, together. Uh, and they, in, in due time he just bankrupted them. But at least Reagan understood that he would never agree on anything with the Soviets, and he never tried. He would go to negotiations because that was a public pressure. He had to go and pretend he's talking to them. But I've seen many of his talks with Gorbachev, and uh, uh, these talks had never been meant to achieve anything. Reagan would, on the contrary, contrary to what Hillary Clinton is saying now, uh, Reagan would start any negotiations with Moscow by talking about human rights and talking in very harsh terms. And also the Soviets would react vehemently saying it's none of your business, you're not supposed to be uh, meddling into our internal affairs. Nevertheless, they would accept some of it and some things would be done. So at least he knew how to handle this thing. I remember long ago in general answering this question I've written in one of the books that uh, Instead of all these nice diplomats with Harvard diplomas, Americans should appoint to negotiate with the Soviets all the experienced sheriff from Chicago. That will help. Okay. All right, over there on the wall. Uh, my name is Miyawaki, George Washington University. Uh, back to 1977, I believe you met with uh, Jimmy Carter president. Yes, and uh, you, I believe you raised the human rights issues. So I'd like to ask you, uh, is, was uh, uh, human, uh, human rights diplomacy of Jimmy Carter uh, effective or successful or not, uh, from point of view? You? Well, Jimmy Carter, unfortunately, was not successful because he was not consistent. He started very well. And the initial reaction from the Soviets was vehement. And they, but they would have accepted quite a lot of it if he continued. Unfortunately for Carter, in due time, it was more important to get, to get SALT II agreement signed. And he started backpedaling from his previous position. He already, in the case of Sharansky, he already said that the United States has no position, we don't want to be involved, and things like that. He started pedaling backwards and uh, indicating to uh, the Soviet counterparts that his stance of hu on human rights was only initial and is not going to continue. And they did understand that. So therefore, he very quickly lost both sides. You know, if he didn't start it with human rights, probably he wouldn't lose that much. Uh, but since he started rightly and so strongly and then retreated so pathetically, uh, he was not respected in Moscow at all. Moscow does respect strong people, even if they are uh, uh, adversaries. They did respect Margaret Thatcher. They did respect Reagan. They hated him, but they respected him. All right, let's cut it off here, uh, our formal session, and go upstairs and have a glass of wine. And before we do that, let's thank Vladimir Bukovsky for being with us again.